So I bring you greetings this morning from uh, Perkins School of Theology, where I have been teaching since January of 2001. So I've been here uh, for a while, and I can tell you for sure that now is a really exciting time to be there. We have a new dean, uh, Craig Hill, so I bring, bring you formal greetings from him. We have uh, relatively new folks like Priscilla and Dallas, and now Ugo is down here. Anyway, all kinds of exciting things are happening at Perkins School of Theology. Bishop Scott Jones uh, is also a Perkins, was a Perkins colleague of mine when I first got here, and he has done wonderful things to partner with us. So you will be seeing lots of new innovative things happening in the Houston area. Um, yeah, coming. So anyway, I am really, really glad to be here. Um, the conversation today will be on the subject of geography and the Bible. You'll also see on your handout that I play with the name a bit, uh, sometimes calling it Land Matters, Theology on the Ground. So you get the idea. So the last thing I have on the list then is pilgrimage today. Many people, as you all have just told me, have been to the Holy Land. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, pilgrimage today and why geography matters to Christians who go to the Holy Land uh, today and how it matters. Okay, so in all of this, when I thought to myself, what, what is the thread through all of this for me? There are three things for me that I keep coming back to uh, in this subject. The first one, and I asked uh, those of you who received the email, I asked you to think about this, and I would actually like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, the first one is, what makes home home? What makes a homeland or home home? What makes you say, I'm from here or not? And there may be, I assume there are people in the room who can clearly say things like, I'm from here, and then tell me about whatever here is. And there are also probably some of us in the room who've never had that experience or feeling for various reasons. So that's one question that has come up for me over and over in looking at scripture on this subject. The second is what makes a promised land a promised land? Because the question then becomes, promised land for whom? And how? How does a land become a promised land? And then a very painful reality. And we could talk about it, you know, I talk a lot about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because it's a lot more comfortable and safe to talk about other people's problems uh, with how they do society in their land. And you and I both know, um, and I'm very happy to get into these conversations. Um, you know, uh, often you have to create spaces of trust and all of that before you can get into some of these difficult conversations. But let me put it this way. Um, there's a lot going on in our nation that, uh, that these topics apply to right now that we could sit and talk about. What makes home home? Who belongs? Who doesn't? Um, et cetera. Um, but you'll see this also in just the fact of when you go to Palestine and you get a presentation on the history of the land, you get one set of maps. Then the next day when the students go over to Shalom Hartman Institute and get a presentation, you get a different set of maps. It's all the same piece of land, right? But how it's divided up and who belongs to whom and who was here, et cetera. So from, and we'll talk a little about the Jewish Zionist uh, project, right? Which people show up, um, you know, Israel becomes a state in 1948. So leading me to this, this point, one people's promised land can equal another people's catastrophe. So, right, and we could talk about that in America, we could talk about manifest destiny, right, because we'll see when we're looking at these texts, when Moses, when all of these folks are coming to the promised land, right, there were already people there. Um, so what you call coming home to the promised land for Jews, the Palestinians call the Nakba, which is the word for catastrophe. So N-A-Q-B-A, it's spelled different ways, but N-A-Q-B-A. So watching through scripture, kind of who's in charge of what land and what it means for the inhabitants of it at any given moment in history. Who's in power and how does that affect people literally on the ground. Um, 
And then finally, something that really strikes me in the New Testament text, because what I'm going to do, we are actually talking about the Old Testament, so um, that will be for the record. You can all say she talked about the Old Testament. I don't want to say we're going to get the Old Testament out of the way, because um, that would be wrong. Uh, but New Testament is my you know, area where I'm home and, and where I live the most. And what strikes me with the New Testament authors um, especially is the simultaneous holding together um, of this global universal scope, right? Christianity really has in mind, I mean, I would argue, and I want to hear, I could be wrong, and I want to hear your opinions, but Christians don't really have the same kind of notion, I don't think, of a place on this earth that is specifically extra meaningful. Yes, we like to take trips to the Holy Land, but if you die without going to the Holy Land, it's a bummer not to get something off your bucket list, but it doesn't have the same level of what? Um, pull, maybe as Mecca, right? Would for Muslim, or Jerusalem has for a Jewish person. And so I've been pondering that for the two summers that I've been at CLI. And I think part of it, it's, it's just there in our tradition. We're going to look at Acts, we're going to look at John. So you'll see simultaneously our New Testament authors really talking about how Christianity really is a universal global thing. I mean, in John 4, we've got to get to John. Every lecture eventually gets to the Gospel of John, uh, even an Old Testament lecture. Because at the end of the story with the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman has this encounter with Jesus. Uh, she goes and tells the townspeople. They come have their own encounter with Jesus. And then they make this statement, right, at the end of John, if you know it. Right? We, they've come to truly know and believe you know, Jesus for themselves instead of through her narrative. Right? But they, what they learn is that he is truly Savior of the world. And the Greek word there is cosmos. So C-O-S-M-O-S -S is how you would transliterate it into English. And that is what Christianity believes. And they didn't know about the solar eclipse and, and all of that. Uh, they didn't know about the universe as we know it. So the word cosmos for them, I think in 2017, we, I don't even think world is the right word to use. I think we actually should be saying cosmos because our universe is bigger than it was for the ancients. And that's the kind of scope Christians have about, um, you know, it's all gods. God created all of it. Uh, there's no kind of special place. On the other hand, we're, we're very concerned about the hyper-local. And you'll see that in Paul's letters. You'll see that it matters what you do. Uh, it's not like, oh, this is just a big epic thing, you know, distant, transcendent thing that I'm a part of. Yes, you are. But you also have commitments and things right in your local community matter. And whether these two people are getting along in their church right here and right now. So in Philippians, uh, Euodia and Suntyche, it, there's, there's a couple of names um, that I did consider when I had a daughter. Um, and then I mean, it's hard to find a girl's name um, in the Bible. I landed on Chloe, but I'm like, how about Euodia? Nobody else is going to have that name, right? So, and it's a good name because you, anything that starts with E-U means good, like a eulogy, euphony. And Odia is way, so good way. That'd be a great thing to name your child, a good path. So no, Jennifer's like, no, no. All right, I didn't. All right, I gave her Chloe. I even gave her Elizabeth, named after Luke 1, um, uh, where, where Elizabeth says to Mary, you know, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has spoken to her will be fulfilled. See, but anyway, you Odia, maybe a grandchild. Um, okay, so you Odia and Suntyche, um, uh, also a great name, uh, aren't getting along in, in Philippi. And people, a lot of do this, do this kind of like um, ridiculous kind of, um, see, now I am getting real with you. It, you know, whenever there's two women having, having an argument, all of a sudden it's a cat fight or something. Instead of what you have is two women who are clearly leaders in the church to the degree that their, their disagreement is disruptive of the community itself. Right? It's the same kind of thing you see in the Johannine epistles when the guys aren't getting along. Um, so don't reduce it to just a cat fight or something. Understand that it matters because these women are in positions of leadership uh, in the church. And it matters so much, Paul can go from kind of the global conversation about Christianity and how we're citizens of the world, our citizenship is in heaven, he'll say, right? Um, his scope of mission is the world. 
but it really matters if two individual people in a church are not getting along, it has cosmic consequences from a Christian viewpoint. So uh, that is a theme that I noticed was in all of our texts. Um, okay, so that is uh, the, the kind of um, aspects of things that I want you to, uh, that I've mapped out, having spent a number of weeks now thinking about this till all hours of the night. So I've divided the time today into uh, these sections. We may or may not get to all of them. We'll see. We'll say something about all of them. Um, so we're going to deal with a couple of Old Testament texts. Of course, we're going to spend some time on Jesus, give Jesus his fair, fair shake. Um, we'll, uh, I'd like to spend some time on Paul. Uh, then we're going to take a look at Acts and then move to Revelation. We will now move into taking a look at the maps here. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a quick overview by map. Then we'll come back and break it down a bit. But this is really just to kind of truly get the lay of the land. So we will start with Abraham. And what I've done, I've included two maps I had printed out. Also on your bibliography, you will see the website from which these maps were taken. So uh, my husband said to tell you, just go to that website. Everything is there. It's done in chronological order, and there are just maps galore. So you have access to that. So here we have uh, Abraham. We're going to start with him and the journey that he made. Because right? we're getting ourselves into the promised land. So from creation into the promised land. Here's a map of exile, right? So um, the Israelites go into, uh, so the Assyrians conquer in the northern region in 722. But in terms of geography that matters theologically, the Babylonian exile was huge in the, and still shapes um, Jewish notions of selves. And, and the Christian authors of the New Testament use the language of Babylon to give the sense of we're here, we're from here and we're not from here. In a way, we're in exile as we live in the world. So uh, the exile looms large. Then you'll see, here's a map of Palestine. And that's the map you have, I believe. And, nope, that's not the one you have, let's see. So what I want, is, want you to see, you'll, uh, we'll go back through these, but um, so up here you have, you'll have Tyre and Sidon. We'll get up there. So you're in the area of Phoenicia when you're up here. Here's the region of Galilee where G Jesus did most of his ministry, of course. This is um, the Sea of Galilee right there, the Jordan River, which empties into, um, down into uh, the Dead Sea, which is receding dramatically as we speak. All right, but here's Galilee, Samaria, when we talk about John 4, and Judea, where Jerusalem um, of course, is the center of that. So, so there's a bit of orientation for us there. Right? This I put up because uh, the Decapolis is an area Jesus did ministry in. And you can see that it's across the Jordan River on the other side. So when he's doing things over in the Decapolis, he's over in a place that, it, in a place that is a, in a giant Semitic area. The Decapolis is a kind of exceptional area of 10 cities, Deca, 10, and then cities, Polis, uh, 10 cities where the culture there, uh, the language, the culture, all of it is, is Roman, Greco-Roman, right? So he's really in the territory of Rome proper, where the values of Rome um, in here. And so, for instance, if we have time to get to Mark chapter 5 with the Gerasene demoni demoniac, when Jesus comes in, because what, what does the guy say? Um, what do the demons say? What's the word they use in the demoniac? They say, we are legion, right? Which is, of course, a Roman military term. Uh, so what you find is Jesus really storming 
empire at that point and undermining the values of empire and showing what true peace and true salvation looks like that you can't get from any emperor or government leader. Um, so the Decapolis becomes very important. It matters that he's in the Decapolis and not doing what he's doing just over in Jerusalem. Right? He's making a claim, again, about being savior of the world. Um, uh, so that becomes important. Uh, again, there's another map of of Palestine. We're going to talk a little bit. I wanted you to see where Megiddo is because in Revelation, you, you know, the final battle is supposed to take place where? It's called Rev Armageddon. And that comes from, that's a real place. And I'll show you some slides. Uh, Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. So again, what happens uh, is there are, these are real places on the ground, but they, they get layers of metaphor added to them. Right? And we'll see the reason uh, Megiddo is conceived of as the place where the last battle would happen this afternoon. Then we, there's Asia Minor where Paul did his work. Right? And uh, a few Asia Minor maps. Paul, of course, is from Tarsus, which is over here. Right? And then so he'll go from uh, Tarsus, right? And he goes to Jerusalem to study with Gamaliel. So Paul's all over the place. He comes down here. You hear of him being in Antioch. This is just a, uh, his first missionary journey. You can find these maps lots of places, right? He ends up going this way, eventually makes it all the way over uh, to Rome. So that's when you get into the realm of Paul. Christianity expands uh, out into Gentile territories. That's the map you have. Uh, you have a map of Paul's third missionary journey. You have a handout. And part of the reason I made that handout is because it also serves for when we talk about Revelation. So all the churches of Revelation, so John, the author of Revelation, is exiled to this little teeny island, Patmos, right? And all the churches of Revelation are right here. And what's interesting, I don't want to get into Revelation right this second, but again, even there... You have Revelation, which people speak of as very, think of as very otherworldly. Okay, but it's not. The whole Revelation is delivered to seven specific real churches in real places uh, in the empire. So that map covers uh, Paul and Revelation. And then here's one that's closer up. Um, so you can see that. And then I love this because, again, my husband's a geography major. So we have an ancient climate map. <laughs> Um, which I just thought was funny, and um, but I know, the, anyway, when you go there, it is actually kind of stark as well. So the, lay, the terrain, those of you who've been there, it is quite stark, right? When you're going from the desert, up, when you get to the Galilee, what happens? Right? You go from just miles and miles of desert, and you see Bedouin, you're like, how are these people living in these tents? Where's the water? Right? It's just orange. Everything's basically orange. Right? Except you get near the Dead Sea and you got palm trees or whatever, but it's pretty much desert and dry. And then in, in no time flat, you're in this lush green area. There's mountains. It's a fascinating terrain in a very small area. Here's modern Israel. So when we talk later today, we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll, we'll visit Joppa um, later today. But anyway, so you know, today you have. Uh, this is the West Bank in Gaza, right there, right? This is Israel proper, right? Then you have Lebanon, Golan Heights, Syria, and Jordan. So that's the modern train. And then one last map. Um, those of us, I'm sorry, we're, we're from Texas. Am I right? This is what, you have to do this for Texans. Okay. I've been here 16 years, so I'm learning. Um, you're like, okay, fine. But anyway, how does that relate to Texas? Uh, so here is... <laughs> So you can fit all of, all of the land of Palestine basically between Dallas and San Antonio. So it's very hard to understand the scope in general until you go there and you think, oh my gosh, all this stuff happened from Genesis to Revelation. A lot of stuff happened in this little plot of land, right? It's, um, people generally find it uh, quite surprising. Okay, so let's look at some texts because that's where I'm happiest is when I'm in texts. 
So we're talking now, we're getting ready to move into uh, this, a conversation about Abraham and land and home. So I want to share with you a poem by John Daniel. It's called A Prayer Among Friends. And uh, I have a new book that came out in November on the Gospel of John called Reading John for Dear Life, A Spiritual Walk with the Fourth Gospel. Uh, and that poem is uh, included in here as well. But it goes like this. Among other wonders of our lives, we are alive with one another. We walk here in the light of this unlikely world that isn't ours for long. May we spend generously the time we are given. May we enact our responsibilities as thoroughly as we enjoy our pleasures. May we see with clarity. May we seek a vision that serves all beings. May we honor the mystery surpassing our sight. And may we hold in our hands the gift of good work and bear it forth whole as we were born forth by a power we praise to this one earth, this homeland of all we love. We sang together, Priscilla asked me for a favorite hymn, and I picked uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing for a number of reasons, but if you remember the words, it speaks of home, and it speaks of wandering. It has mountains in it, and you'll find that mountains are very important um, important geographical markers, and spiritual things happen on mountains a lot in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So mountains, they're real. They exist in this land. You can go stand on them today. But they also are um, symbolic. Uh, you also see in, the, in this word, does everybody know what Ebenezer is? Here I, we sing it all the time. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Aren't you like, what's an Ebenezer? And you're like, I'm going to Google that when I get home because you don't want to Google in church because that would be wrong while the pastor is preaching. Um, uh, so then you forget to do it when you get home until you sing it again. So, so Ebenezer uh, is Evan Ezer, which is um, stone of help. So Ezer um, is help. God's actually called a helper uh, in the Bible. Uh, and it, re it relates to a story in 1 Samuel when uh, they are, the Israelites are coming up against the Philistines and God provides a miracle. Basically, they should have lost and gotten squashed. That's actually the Jewish story throughout history. How they're still here is kind of a miracle because uh, people are constantly trying to wipe them out. Um, so God helps Israel defeat the Philistines. And so Samuel uh, places a stone there. This kind of story happens a lot in the Bible. They place stones and name things. And this, this area is called Ebenezer, stone of help, uh, to reflect that. So that's what you're doing. Uh, when you sing that song. So the song has, has already shows how we use geography metaphorically and theologically, you know, um, even if we aren't paying attention uh, to it. So Christians, we Christians are living in a certain time in a certain place on this earth, which has been home in some sense of the word to billions of people before us. We believe in a God who acts in particular and universal ways. So on the one hand, we believe in a God who interacts with God's whole creation, right, with you and me even, in specific particular ways. So again, if we were a smaller group and had more time, here's what I would ask. I would ask you to give me an example from your own life where you could say that the God who created the cosmos interacted with you in some personal particular way. And I'm happy to hear that story um, on breaks. If you have not had that experience, I'm also happy to talk about that. Uh, but I hope you have. On the other hand, we understand ourselves to be part of an epic storyline, a, a, a tale of what one author calls storied earth. Earth is full of stories. And this epic shines forth from Genesis to Revelation. So one thing you'll see, the reason you end up having to do the whole canon, even though you really can't in six hours, right? Because what we're, go what we're doing is we're going from creation to creation, right? The canon was put together in a very logical way. By canon, I mean the 66 books of the Bible and the order that they're placed in. They are not placed in chronological order. The books in your Bible are not placed in the order in which they were written. The canon is shaped by theological principles. So 
we start with, new, with creation in Genesis, or the creation of heaven and earth. And in Revelation, we end with what? The creation of new heaven and a new earth. But here's the thing. Um, this is a mythic grand story that is tied to our daily lived historical reality. That's the claim the Bible makes. These stories are mythic and epic, and they're also your story uh, in very serious ways. We cannot walk across every acre of the Bible today, um, so we're going to touch down in a few places. What's interesting about Revelation, and a mistake that is often made by some people, okay, Baptists, um, but other people too, there somehow is this notion, there was this first heaven and first earth, and all this is going to hell in a handbasket, and it's going to get blown up in some kind of apocalyptic whatever, and we're going to fly away to somewhere else, I don't know, and there's going to be some new heaven, new earth. That's not what the Bible talks about, right? So Revelation, even though it's apocalyptic, is not at all interested in this, this particular earth going to hell in a handbasket. It's talking about the new heaven and new earth. They descend from heaven, right? It's here. Th this is it, folks. This is it. There's nowhere else, right? And God's vision is for how we're going to do things here. So it is better to think of it actually as a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. It's a way of using language to talk about what it would be like if things were done the way God would have them done at every minute of the day. Then you'd be there. And in Christian theology, we've been told we're equipped to actually get this done with the Holy Spirit. Um, so the idea is not to just to hang on and you know stay safe from the world and not be defiled, unless you're the book of James, but let's forget him for the moment. Right? It's not to just kind of wait till it all passes and this is all going to get blown up and there'll be something else. No, get out there. You know, this, this is it. This is the arena for all of it. So it starts at the beginning uh, with creation. It starts with the creation of the earth. And if you have your Bibles, uh, and you, you can either listen or turn to Genesis 1 1. So if we were, you see the first, the first slide is of Abraham and is not of creation. Because if you say, where is creation on a map? Right? Well, it's no place. Literally, utopia. Right? When you think of the Garden of Eden, you're talking in a way about a utopia. You're talking about a time and a state of being that is defined by innocence. This time frame is mythic time. So the Bible opens in Genesis and ends in Revelation in mythic cosmic time. So that everything in between, the idea is everything in between is somehow related to that. But that's the framework we're working with. So in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind, bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. So you'll remember from Genesis when we get to Revelation, the business about trees. And a famous tree that got created is the tree of life, right? Again, and we'll see the canon wrap up and conclude uh, at the end of the day with the tree of life. So then, unfortunately, uh, you see the story of, um, well, the good story of the creation uh, before the expulsion. The creation first of earth, and then next you get the creation of people. Now, the, the point I want to make, uh, the language, so when God creates the first person, 
right? God creates from Adama, right? Which is a, one of the words for land or earth, right? So God picks up and creates from Adama, in fact, from dirt. Um, this is dirt, and I'll tell you why. I have dirt here. This is dirt from the pool of Siloam uh, in Israel. And it's really important when you get to John 9, um, where Jesus uh, then will um, use mud uh, in order to heal the blind man's eyes. And it is connected to what I'm about to say right now. So you have Adama, the earth, right? And what God does is takes from the earth and creates Adam, the earth creature. Okay? So from the very beginning, we are landed, right? We are connected to this earth and actually created from it. In the same way, um, so here I'll just, because I said it already here in an edited fashion, so I'll say it here. Uh, the Genesis creation, um, so you have the Genesis, uh, this creation story here. So in Genesis 2-7, the first human person, called in Hebrew Adam, is formed of dust from the Adama, the earth. They're an agrarian society, so you know how they say, I don't even know if this is true, that Eskimos have 50 words for snow that you hear all the time, but, uh, but Israelites have 50 words for earth. I mean, agrarian people have different words for different kinds of soil. So literally, Adam means earth creature. It is not a proper name as such. You kind of miss the point. Uh, if you just think of it as a proper name, Adam. It is symbolic language. Likewise, when the next human creature is made, she is named Chava, from the Hebrew verb to live, because she is the mother of all living things. So the, in English translation, these automatically get put in as Adam and Eve, and they are eventually individual persons. That's part of the story as it goes. Um, in English translations, they're put into the names Adam and Eve, and they, but they get detached, I think, from the uh, original, beautiful, meaning-heavy roots. As the story unfolds in Genesis, gender comes into existence and becomes a source of alienation. Um, then what will happen is you'll see picked up in the New Testament this language. Again, the dirt that Jesus uses in John 9 to heal the blind man is connected to this story. In fact, all the way through John, the Genesis story appears all the way to the end of the Gospel. Um, this thing I just said about gender. So Adam and Eve are placed where? They're created and they live in a garden, right? At the end of the story of John, when Jesus is resurrected, he meets uh, Mary. Where does he meet her? In a garden. So the original kind of gender alienation that you see in Genesis becomes, um, you see reconciliation. That's part of that story. It's kicking back to Genesis. Um, so even before we get to named cities, when we start from the very beginning talking about this earth, these themes run all the way through scripture and will give layers to your interpretation if you know it's there. So they're then driven from the garden from utopia. Right? They're driven from utopia, loss of innocence, and they have to grow up. Um, so it raises the issue then uh, of where we belong and what makes home home. So we sing the song, this land is your land, this land is my land. And then the question becomes, is it? And how? So we hear this, the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Hold that thought for the whole day till we get to Revelation. Um, so that's Genesis 3, 21 to 24. All right, so you have creation. Then we have Abraham. So our first slide here. Right? Adam and Eve are not the only ones who left home as they knew it. So taking a look at Abraham and Sarah, hearing this story starting in Genesis 11. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together 
from Ur of the Chaldeans, which is, you see, from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Okay? So now I've got Abram in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families, all the families of the earth, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. Is anybody in here around that age? You can show you. Be proud. Okay, if you're around that age. All right, he's 75 years old. And here comes God. And guess what? Got it? Okay. So um, he was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son-in-law and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. We could talk about that, uh, but we'll plow on. Uh, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moreh. Okay, so Shechem is modern Nablus. Okay, and this is where um, uh, Jacob's well. Uh, so, again, what starts to happen, what I'm trying to do is point out to you some meaningful Old Testament places. There's too many. Um, but especially I'm picking out ones that will end up having special meaning in the, the New Testament. Uh, okay, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So remember that for future conversations, especially the Gospel of Matthew. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel. And the word Bethel means is Beit El, the house of God. And pitched his tent and, uh, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. Then Abraham journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. Okay, um, on that, and then we're moving to Genesis 15, 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt, so the river of Egypt, to the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay, so Tigris and Euphrates, birthplace of civilization. Right? Um, so Euphrates River, right there. Tigris River, there's over in Egypt. Okay, so I give this land, and this, this is very important in modern Jewish thinking about the land and settling the land uh, in Palestine. Uh, the river, and river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Remember? Girgashites and the Jebusites. Moving to Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, it's not over yet, people. <laughs> the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. And then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. So Am is the Hebrew word for people. Um, and you know the word Abba, father. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will, so, so the other thing to pay attention to is people's names. So land has meaningful theological names. People get their name changed a lot in the Old Testament and the New uh, for theological reasons. I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. 
I'm again, I'm in Genesis 17, 1 to 8. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien. All the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding. And I will be their God. So this gets Abraham into the area of Palestine. Okay, so we're moving, uh, moving over. I'm going to stop and uh, share with you a poem that some of you may have heard just because there's a number of you who say, how many of y'all are in the 75 or older range? Okay, this is for you. Okay, this is a poem by one of my favorite uh, poets called Killian McDonnell. It's called The Call of Abraham. And it takes off of Genesis 12, 1, where God says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country. It goes like this. Talk about imperious without a may I presume? No previous contact, no letter of introduction. This unknown God issues edicts. This is not a conversation. Am I a nobody to receive decrees from one whose name I do not know? I have worshipped my own God. To you I had addressed no prayers, but quick, like sudden fire in the desert, I hear, go. At 75, am I supposed to scuttle my life? Take that ancient wasteland, Sarai. Place my arthritic bones upon the road to some mumbled nowhere? Let me get this straight. I'll be brief. I summarize. In 10 generations since the flood, you've spoken to no one. Now, like thunder on a clear day, you give commands, pull up my tent, desert the graves of my ancestors, leave Haran for a country you do not name, there to be a stranger. God of the wilderness, from two desiccated lumps, from two parched prunes, you promise all peoples of the earth will be blessed in me. You come late, Lord, very late, but my camels leave in the morning. <laughs>